Okay, first I want to start off by thanking Dr. Ganur and uh, my good friend Asaf Mogadam and who I believe is the hardest working man in show business, uh, Mr. Stevie Weinberg and the whole entire ICT team for inviting me to what is always a great conference. It's always a first class event. I always look forward to uh, speaking to this audience, so thank you. I should also say up front that as a disclaimer, uh, the views and opinions that I'm going to talk about today are mine and mine alone. They don't represent uh, the U.S. Military Academy, the U.S. Army, or the Department of Defense. You know, it's funny because when I was here two years ago, I gave a talk on another unconventional topic. Uh, I talked about the analogy between counterterrorism and oncology, uh, specifically what I felt counterterrorism policymakers could learn about how we combat chronic diseases like cancer, even though I'm not a medical doctor and I have no background in medicine. So this year, I'm talking about some of the lessons that we can learn from an anti-smoking advertising campaign in countering the narrative of the Islamic State. And yet again, I don't have any background in the field of marketing and advertising. So I told my wife that I was presenting on yet another weird topic. She suggested that next year I should talk about counterterrorism and other things that I don't know much about, like cooking and doing the dishes and taking the garbage out when it needs to go out. So unfortunately, I didn't think it was as funny as you did, uh, but stay tuned to next year. So the genesis of my talk today occurred actually last spring uh, when we held a, uh, my organization, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, held a counterterrorism conference. And our goal at this conference was to expose U.S. counterterrorism officials uh, to experts in other fields that were completely outside of the field of counterterrorism, but who were also struggling with some of the same challenges that we all face in the CT community. For example, on a panel where we were discussing uh, building partner capacity, we brought in the director from Doctors Without Borders as a featured speaker. For our panel on winning the war of ideas, we brought in the man pictured here on this slide, Mr. Pete Favat. Pete is the co-creator of the Truth Anti-Smoking Campaign that earned the award for the top advertising campaign of the decade in the 2000s. Now, I don't have to tell the people in this room the importance uh, behind the war of ideas as it relates to this current fight. And I think while we in the West have both understood and acknowledged the importance of strategic communications, we have also struggled mightily in this specific domain. And some would even say that we are either losing and or are failing. As the late Richard Holbrook wondered, why can't the United States, the world's leading communications society, do better in this fight? And that's why we brought in Pete Favat. And today I want to share with you some of the lessons that we learned about his experiences in crafting a counter-industry approach. Now, adolescent smoking has been a, a pretty big problem in the United States for a long time, and the anti-smoking public service advertisements in the past seem to just have little or no effect. Some of these campaigns were run by the government as public service announcements. Others were either weak and watered down attempts by the big tobacco companies themselves, but all failed to significantly curb teenage smoking. In fact, in one academic study, that analyzed the effectiveness of the Think Don't Smoke campaign, an effort which targeted both adolescents and their parents, they determined that the campaign not only failed, but was actually counterproductive. So while the ads targeted young people had no effect on their own smoking, they actually found that the, when the, the kids had, were exposed to the uh, advertisements targeting their parents, it actually increased adolescent smoking. So not exactly the metric of an effective anti-smoking campaign. Thus, when Pete Favat's term was asked to take up the fight in 2000 with money from an out-of-court settlement between uh, smoking or families that had uh, suffered some medical uh, problems from smoking and the big tobacco companies, it truly was a David versus Goliath scenario. At the time, uh, big tobacco was spending upwards to $13 billion per year on marketing, and they believed that at, uh, at the time uh, the average 14-year-old had been exposed uh, to over $20 billion in big tobacco marketing uh, since the age of six. Big Tobacco also owned uh, some of the most powerful brands in the consumer market, and celebrity endorsers made smoking look cool. Now, Pete and his team were up, up against some pretty tall odds when it came to reducing teenage smoking, and some thought that they were actually really crazy uh, when they decided that their plan was going to be to, quote, outbrand Big Tobacco, and to do so using this counter-industry approach. As Pete tells it, here they had a bunch of uh, seasoned professionals in the advertising world 
had spent their entire careers trying to sell products to people. And this was a unique position because this was the first time that they were ever going about trying to, quote, unsell a product. So how do they go about doing it? Well, ironically, they actually went back to the same research that Big Tobacco used to market cigarettes to kids back in the 1950s and 1960s. And one of these concepts focused on what psychologists call the age of assertion, uh, that time in a child's life when their brain is developed to the point where they want to assert more control over their own decisions and increase their own independence from their parents. And for anyone out there that has either raised uh, teenagers or preteens, you, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about the age of assertion. Big Tobacco also exploited the psychological need states of teenagers, and specifically their desire to rebel, to take risks, to feel empowered, and to feel respected. And for those that are studying the current foreign fighter threat right now, those should sound like familiar uh, reasons because there are a lot of the stated reasons uh, for why people are joining jihadist organizations like the Islamic State and leaving their homes to go fight in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. Now, as Pete put it, these need states, these psychological need states of teenagers are, are global and they're constant. They hold true from Baghdad to Beijing. Now, to give you a taste of what the anti-smoking campaign used to look like before Pete Favat's truth campaign, take a look at this uh, simple graphic uh, next to me. Big Tobacco's marketing uh, was positioned in that upper right-hand quadrant. It was empowering. It was rebellious. And it targeted a lot of those psychological need states that I had just showed on the previous slide. Big Tobacco essentially was making smoking look cool and attractive. On the other hand, the old anti-smoking campaigns in the 1990s were in the opposite bottom left quadrant. If you can recall the ineffective uh, Just Say No campaign in the United States or the ridiculously bad uh, tobacco is wacko slogan that emerged from this time, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, these types of things were preachy, they were controlling, and they really didn't resonate with the targeted audience. I'm about to show you a clip from the, that old Think Don't Smoke campaign that was representative of anti-smoking efforts uh, in that campaign back in the 1990s. And I apologize ahead of time for the uh, cheesy 1990s music, the, the bad acting, and the preachy undertone. So hopefully this will work. Hey, Christy! So now take a look at, you know, Pete Favat's challenge. It was to make the truth anti-smoking campaign more like big tobaccos. He had to make anti-smoking empowering, rebellious, and for lack of a better term, cool. The next clip is a good example of their type of marketing. Uh, this is coming from the truth campaign itself. And I'd like you to pay particular attention to both the look, the feel, and the sound of this commercial. The name of this commercial is called 1200, to represent the 1200 people who die every day as a result of smoking-related diseases. So take a look at this version. He was also a genius at guerrilla marketing techniques to enhance the rebellious, rebelliousness of that truth brand. Now, the truth command, one of the things that they did was they, uh, they would buy out uh, centerfold two-page advertisements, and they targeted specifically skateboard magazines and punk magazines. 
uh, to target that, that, that youth. And so what they would ask their youth fans to do is at prominent bookstores and prominent uh, newsstands to go open all those magazines up to that two-page centerfold and then place it in the magazine racks. So it was a pretty much like uh, you know, uh, free advertising for, for the Truth Campaign. Additionally, they would also uh, ask folks to go into stores like Apple, uh, where you have a lot of computers up and where you can access the internet. So they would instruct their, their folks, their fans, to go into an Apple store almost like a covert flash mob, uh, and then go to a specific website where they would have the Truth Campaign advertisement on there, and then at kind of one appointed time, everyone would leave the store. And so once you left the store, you'd walk by, you'd walk in, and there's all these uh, orange computers up. So uh, essentially, it was edgy, it was cool, and it was effective. So what does anything I'm having to talk about today have to do with counterterrorism or countering the, the narrative of jihadi groups like the Islamic State? What I will argue is that we are in a similar situation positionally wise that P. Favat was when he started uh, to outbrand Big Tobacco in the Truth Campaign. Our enemies are now occupying a space in that upper right hand quadrant. They have the brand that is empowering, rebellious, and cool to the younger generation as evidenced by the unprecedented numbers of uh, a lot of folks going to wage jihad in Syria and Iraq to include thousands from the West. And so as the good guys, we unfortunately are trying to, in my opinion, outbrand the Islamic State from that preachy and controlling quadrant down the bottom left. In fact, there are a lot of similarities between the failed slogans from the 1990s and the anti-smoking campaign. If you think back, that was called Think, Don't Smoke. And today's slogan used by the US government today is Think Again, Turn Away. Now, I'm not disparaging any of the valiant attempts by our government to do really good work in this space, I'm just saying that I think we need to find more creative, agile, and potentially risque ways to outbrand our enemy. And for those of you uh, looking at that top left quadrant has a, an old picture of Al Batar's logo, they just changed that over the weekend, but I was not uh, spry enough to change it on the fly, so don't, don't sharpshoot me. I think we can do better. When I taught a class on strategic communications in terms of uh, counterterrorism earlier this spring at West Point, uh, I showed the class the U.S. government's Twitter feed, which blasts out content in an overt status. And this story just happened to be on the feed that day. And it's about a man who was uh, living in Raqqa, I believe, and had fled or had to flee uh, Syria uh, because of the Islamic State coming in. And then he returned a bunch of months later to find that his cat was still living in his apartment. Now. I don't know if there's more to this story. I don't know if the cat was, had become radicalized at that point, and there's some stuff going on. I think I'm happy for both the man and the cat, but I'm skeptical that this is the type of influential content that we really need uh, in this fight at this time. And I think at the end of the day, I think we can and we should do better. Now, before I close, I want to emphasize that there, you know, I'm going to acknowledge right up front that there are obvious and important differences between reducing teenage smoking and reducing those that want to go out and wage jihad. But I do think that there are several takeaways and lessons learned that can help us in today's counter-narrative fight. First, the Truth Campaign, when they first started out, felt that if advertising played an influential role in getting kids to start smoking, which it did, well then advertising could also help in the fight against teenage smoking. And I believe the same is true in countering the foreign fighter threat as well. That's not to say that a counter-industry approach like the one that Pete Favat ran is going to eliminate radicalization or stop the tide of foreign fighters going to Syria and Iraq, but I do believe it will be an improvement over our current efforts. I'm also well aware that the United States in the past has used the private sector advertising uh, geniuses from Madison Avenue before in its public diplomacy campaigns, particularly in the Middle East as well which many argue were you know, less than effective, but I don't think the US government, to my knowledge, has employed a counter-industry approach or have sought out to people like Pete Favat uh, to see what their recommendations are in, uh, in, in counter-violent extremism operations, and I think it should. Second, as mentioned, we are in a similar position in the War of Ideas landscape as the Truth Campaign was against Big Tobacco. And I think that we can learn a lot from uh, that counter-industry approach. I don't think we've done uh, the necessary things to learn more. And finally, and I think this may be the most important point, the Truth Campaign succeeded uh, partially in part because it was perceived to be made by kids for kids. And I emphasize perceived, perceived because it was actually uh, the Pete Favats of the world, some, some middle-aged <laughs> advertising geniuses, 
who are actually tapping into the look, the feel, and the vibe of the younger generation. In fact, the first couple uh, commercials that aired from the Truth Campaign, uh, including some that were even more off-putting than the one that I put before you today, uh, they received hundreds of complaints from adults uh, and parents, and uh, as you can imagine, Pete's corporate bosses fielding those calls uh, were, were none too pleased, and they uh, told Pete that they were pretty skeptic about uh, moving forward with the project. But counterintuitively, Pete was actually happy about all that criticism from the parents and adults, and particularly the corporate suits. To him, if the adults didn't like the commercials, that was actually a good thing. To him, that was actually a metric of success. Young people, on the other hand, loved the ads. They got it. And then to him, that's all that mattered. And I'd like to see the US government invest more in, in public-private partnerships that will help replicate uh, this type of counter-industry model and tap into that younger generation and utilizing uh, those good ideas and the grassroots work that Pete Favat and his campaign did. Now the good news, good news story here is that the State Department is already moving in this direction. Uh, they've started to fund a private uh, sector initiative to engage uh, both undergraduate and graduate universities in the United States and abroad to develop such a social media campaign. So they're trying to tap into the good ideas of that younger generation. And the class that I'm teaching right now at West Point is actually one of those schools. So we'll have a crack at the pinata to see if we can, we can do any better. I want to thank the good folks at ICT for inviting me to this conference, and I look forward to uh, your questions and comments and sidebar conversations throughout the conference. Thank you.